Okay. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's snowshoe and ski touring clinic. Um, it was really fun to have four inches of fresh snow this morning and it really like helped to get me in the mood for ski touring. Um, so really looking forward to Kay and Alan and what they have to say. Um, they're going to share some tips for how to get into snowshoeing, how to get into ski touring, what gear you need, some safety considerations, as well as great places to go along the Front Range. Um, my name is Sarah Gorecki, and I'm the publishing officer at the Colorado Mountain Club and publisher of CMC Press. Um, Alan and Kay have, have two books that they've published with CMC Press, and one is Ski Touring Routes, and the other is Snowshoe Routes, and these are fantastic books if you're looking to get into these sports, find places to go, um, and both of their books are going to be 25% off tonight on our website, which is cmc.org slash books, um, using the promo code ski tour 25, which I'll put in the chat. So both books will be 25% off tonight if you're interested in checking them out. Um, and anyone who buys a copy of either book tonight on our website will be entered into a drawing to win a CMC buff with these pretty colors. So a nice neck gaiter, um, and I'll announce the winner at the end of the event. Um, okay, so a little bit of Zoom reminders. I'm sure you're all quite familiar with using Zoom by now, but um, so here are some friendly Zoom reminders. Um, please keep your microphones muted and your cameras off. Um, this session is being recorded and it will be on CMC's YouTube channel in the next few days or a couple of weeks. Um, and please do ask all of your questions in the chat. We will take a couple of a few questions as we go, and then we'll save the rest for the Q and A at the end of the talk. Um, and now to to introduce tonight's speakers, Alan Apt is a teacher of Nordic and Alpine skiing and snowshoeing at Eldora with the Ignite Adaptive Program, and he is a certified ski instructor by PSIA. He has been with the National Ski Patrol with Bryan Mountain and Diamonds Peaks Nordic Ski Patrols and is now an alumni member. Kay Turnbaugh has been cross-country skiing for over 50 years, formerly worked at Eldora Ski Area, and is also the author of Following in Their Footsteps, Historical Hikes of the Northern Front Range, as well as other history and natural science books. And now over to you, Alan and Kay. Yeah, well, thanks everybody for coming out. Really appreciate it. And uh, the COVID era has kept us on Zoom. Uh, I guess that's good given the roads being a little icy tonight. And it's good to get some snow because we've been getting dribs and drabs and the trails can use it and so can we. Yes, welcome everybody. Hope, hope uh, you're all cozy at home and ready to tour the state with us. Yeah, some so, people ask me what the what the photo is on the ski touring cover. That's actually a skier on Flat Top Mountain on the east slope that you can access off of Lake Helene, which is the route on snowshoe routes. That's the cover of snowshoe routes. Hmm. Anyway, off we go. Oh, hold on. There we go. So we'll, we'll go uh, quickly over snowshoeing equipment, some ski equipment, what to take with you, safety tips, how to pick a trail that's appropriate. You know, I think the main thing is having fun and making sure you have a trail. Your goals is, is really, I think, important. Particularly if you're uh, on a family outing, you know, there's a lot of information available online, but we try to provide more information in our books to make it easier to choose a trail that's appropriate, know what you're getting into. Uh, and then we'll give an overview of, of trails, uh, a fraction of what's in our books uh, with some slides. Put any questions in the chat and we'll uh, try to answer them as we go along. <clears throat> so snowshoes have evolved a lot. On the right side there, you have some ancient ones that worked well at the time, 
but the ones on the left, the Atlas, were sort of the first of, of the uh, new generation of snowshoes, lighter, more compact, but still sturdy and able to get some good flotation. But they're much easier to use than the old models that had uh, awkward strapping. What kind of snowshoe? There's a wide variety you can get. And I always recommend people rent some and try them out before they buy them. This is a picture of my favorite, the MSRs, because they're so simple uh, in terms of the straps and they're a nice size and they get good flotation and they're fairly lightweight <clears throat> and they have really good claws, um, both on the sides and the bottom. So if you're traversing uh, across a steep slope, you won't slide out sideways. But do try them on in the store uh, if you're renting them and make sure that you know how to get the straps to work. <clears throat> Skis have evolved a lot too. Uh, when I started skiing eons ago, there were just the real skinny skis in the backcountry. Um, and of course, what we have now are, are skinny skis, as the one on the left are. Uh, and they've gotten a little bit wider. So I call them mid width. Uh, so you can use the mid width in a ski area where it's groomed or the skinny skis as well. And what's really dramatically changed is the wider skis on the right, also known as fat skis. So a general rule of thumb is the steeper the trail, the deeper the snow, the wider the ski. If you're in a, a Nordic area, they're grooming the trails and it's not as much of a concern. Uh, and the wider the ski is, the easier it is to balance and control. So if you're not an experienced skier, uh, a slightly wider ski with some metal edges is a good idea. The nice thing about skis today is uh, it used to be you had to wax them to climb, and that's still a really good way to go, particularly if you know uh, which wax to use for the temperature. <clears throat> and it's the the temperature range is on the side of the wax that you'll buy or rent or whatever. Um, but sometimes, uh, particularly with climate change, temperatures change and makes it problematical if you're waxing. At the lower left-hand corner, you can see that the modern, more modern skis also have uh, treads. Uh, and those allow you to stomp your feet and climb up a hill without messing around with wax. They're also known as patterns or waxless skis. The guy on the right is using a climbing skin. Climbing skins used to be real uh, problematical. I mean, they were great for climbing, but they had no glide. And now you can, you can climb with them. You can even glide downhill if you're in a steep area and you're nervous about getting down safely. You can leave your skins on and still glide downhill. they have to be fit to your particular ski. <clears throat> a friend of mine likes to, say, likes to say that what it really begins with is the ski boot. The boots will determine which kind of ski you want to use and how comfortable it will be. And the touring boots uh, are generally gonna work with the NNN. The SNS has kind of been outmoded, but you'll still find some skis uh, that are compatible with the Solomon system, but they've tried to go to more universal bindings, so you don't necessarily have to buy that ski manufacturer's product. And as with the skis, you start on the left with the skinniest ski and a lighter boot, and you go all the way over to the right with a fatter ski, either a Telemark ski or an AT ski, and a much heavier boot. So it's always nice to have as light and as simple a gear as you can because getting them uphill is a lot of work. Um, and here you can see the bottoms of the various boots. The boot on the right is the old leather boot that sits in a three pin binding. And the ones on the left are the uh, newer bindings that clip into a metal uh, binding. They're all very easy to use for the most part. But you just have to make sure you get the snow out of the binding before you clip it on.
So what to bring with you, you know, um, boots and gaiters are a good idea. You can see the gaiters on the skier in the right-hand corner. Those allow you to go in deeper snow without having snow in your boot. Some people have uh, long ski pants that prevent the snow from getting in your boots. So you wanna make sure that you're bulletproof in terms of that, you know, um, and that's true not only for skiing, but also snowshoeing. I've seen people trying to snowshoe in running shoes and you're gonna get really cold feet if you don't have appropriate waterproof boots uh, and something to keep the snow out of the top. So I think it's a good idea to, to uh, go with a waterproof insulated boot uh, for snowshoeing. And most of the boots that are available now for skiing are much warmer than the old leather boots and they are waterproof. I like to have poles for snowshoeing as well as skiing. They're great for getting traction going uphill or downhill and they make it a lot less likely that you're gonna fall uh, on snowshoes. Uh, and skis, they're, they're really essential. Um, and you just want to make sure they're the right length. So if you're renting poles, uh, make sure that you have some assistance in determining the correct length. Uh, a pack is a great idea. Uh, you'll want to have lots of layers because it can start off sunny and warm in the morning and be a blizzard in the afternoon and vice versa. It can start off cold and snowy. The sun will pop out and you, then you're too warm and you want some place to put uh, some of that clothing. And sometimes you have to take off your skis or your snowshoes because it's rocky. And if, particularly if you're trying to do a summit, the, the trail gets blown free of snow and you have to be able to carry those things. If you're skiing in steep terrain, particularly in trees, a helmet is a great idea. Um, your, your head isn't as hard as you think it is. Uh, even little branches don't feel really good. Uh, don't sk skimp on, on water and food. And it's great to have a nice warm beverage, particularly if you have little guys along, hot chocolate, uh, hot tea, uh, and a variety of snacks. You'll be burning up lots of calories and you wanna maintain your energy with things like chocolate um, and anything else that you wanna bring. Bring a lunch if you're gonna be out there for uh, a couple of hours. And it's good to have someone along, particularly if you're, if you're far into the backcountry on anything steep and hairy on skis, uh, you wanna have somebody along to dig you out if you get caught in an avalanche or just for fun. And then there's always the question about whether or not to bring your dog. Um, I don't ski with a dog, yeah, but we, Alan does. We, yeah, we uh, generally don't bring our dog out because she's not that tall and she's not that young. And if you put booties on her, she'll take off if she's not on leash and the booties come off and the booties come off even if she is on leash. Um, now, most of the trails in, in uh, National Forest are open to dogs. The Some of the Boulder County uh, and other county parks do not allow dogs. So, um, you know, we try to make note of that in the book. Um, but it is a good idea, good idea to keep your dog on a leash because there are critters like moose that don't like dogs. Dog goes to moose, moose chases dog back to person, moose ch stomps down a person. That happens a lot. Also, if the dog goes off a steep embankment, they can get caught in a snowdrift and you will have a heck of a time getting them back up the slope. So uh, having them on leash isn't a bad idea unless it's, you know, flat open terrain, not snow's not that deep and you have good voice control. So as I said, <clears throat> conditions can change. This was a day when I was up with a friend and we were climbing up Flat Top Mountain in Rocky Mountain National Park. You can see Hallett's Peak over my left shoulder. 
and there was a lot of wind the day before we went up. And even though it was uh, spring and there was a lot of deep snow, there were sections of the trail that were completely blown free of snow and were dirt and rocks. So it's a good idea to have a pack where you can tie your snowshoes or skis on in case that happens. It's not fun to have to try to carry that stuff in your in your hands. Check like that poles with you. Skiing is somewhat more challenging than snowshoeing. You know, the old motto with snowshoeing is if you can walk, you can snowshoe. That's generally true. Now, what you'll find though, if you're out on snowshoes and it's deep powder, it is going to take uh, more effort than it will on a, on a hiking day. So be conservative. As far as cross country skiing is concerned, the equipment is much easier to use. But if you've never done it, it's a lot easier to learn from a professional ski instructor than it is from a spouse or a friend. I know that uh, they, they, they have a lot of techniques and ideas that are, are going to really save you a lot of time and trouble. Uh, this picture on the left is herring, herring boning. That's what you, the position you put your skis in if you're climbing uphill, even with the patterns on the bottom. The skins, you can pretty much go straight up. If you're going down on skis, there's something called the snowplow, where you're pointing the tips at each other and flaring out the heels. And the snowplow is a good way to go down. Whether you're going up or down with skis or snowshoes, I think it's always a really good idea to traverse, traverse across steep slopes and go back and forth and create your own uh, trails. Um, generally, most of our trails are already uh, doing that. They're switchbacking and it's uh, a lot easier than trying to go straight up or straight down. Of course, if you're an expert skier, we do have some steep descents where you can do that and get some turns in. Um, pole straps are good for hanging onto skis, or excuse me, hang onto your poles in deep snow. If you're in trees uh, and you're an expert skier and you're going down through trees, it's a good idea to take your pole straps off because your pole will catch a branch and dislocate your shoulder. So a little tip. Uh, other ways to climb other than hair boning is sidestepping works really well. And if you get into a, a hairy spot where you don't know if you can ski down, uh, even in a snowplow, sidestepping down also works real well. And as I said, you want the right equipment for the trail. Steeper means fatter skis. Snowshoeing techniques. Uh, Sliding is not really an option. So if you're some of the older snowshoes that are just tubes, you will find on a steep slope like this, if you're crossing or traversing, uh, that you will, your snowshoes might slide sideways, particularly if they only have one uh, claw on the bottom. That's why I like the MSR that my friends here are wearing, because they can go traverse across anything uh, without sides slipping. Switchbacking is still a good idea. When you're going uphill, you're up on your toes. When you're going downhill, you're back on your heels. And it's a lot easier to jog downhill if you have some ski poles. You can jog through the powder, have a lot of fun. The only cautionary note, if you're trying to jog through powder, have a pretty good idea that the snow is deep enough that you're not going to stumble over a rock or a tree stump. So that's not, not a, a good, good idea right now when uh, the, the rocks and the stumps are still a factor early in the season. <clears throat> Even if you're on snowshoes and you're being careful, it's you step on a unconsolidated pile of snow or uh, a rock or a tree well and you fall, the thing to do is take your, your poles off if you have them, put them under your side and push up on your poles. Try to get your feet downhill 
and your head uphill before doing that. That's all. That's good for either skis or snowshoes. Uh, you know, it's sometimes with some people they get so discombobulated that you, they cannot get up even with your assistance, and you have to take the skis off. I, you don't generally have to do that with snowshoes. The, the downside of taking skis off in deep snow is they're going to post hole. Uh, so if you can get them to get up without taking your skis off, it's a much better option. So you can have a lot of fun in the backcountry without getting frostbite or hypothermia or sunburn. But do keep in mind that in Colorado, we are at altitude. And I know when I have family visiting from other places, they frequently have issues going from sea level up to eight, nine, 10, 11,000 feet, which is where a lot of our trails are in Colorado, even Boulder uh, and Denver are around 5,000 feet. So keep that in mind. And, front, and altitude can affect anyone at any time from anywhere. So, you know, if you uh, start feeling lightheaded uh, or headachy or nauseous, or anyone in your party does, frequently a, a good solution is go get at a lower elevation. Uh, keep a, an eye on the weather. Make sure you know what the weather forecast is for where you're going. And the Colorado Avalanche Information Center is a good source, as is the National Weather Service online. And it's a good idea to get an avalanche awareness course if you're if you're in, interested in summiting steep slopes in the winter, you don't want to be in an avalanche like that. This is from up on Berthoud Pass, on a, just above a very popular trail known as Second Creek. And it doesn't look like avalanche terrain, but you can see that it is. So uh, be aware of the slope angle. I have a slope angle device I take with me. And anything over 25 degrees uh, is where the sweet spot for avalanches occur, especially 30 degrees and above. And that's kind of, if, you, if you're uh, a skier, a downhill skier, that's about equivalent to a black slope, uh, an advanced black slope, or double black diamond is very likely to avalanche, which is why they do avalanche control in ski areas. I just uh, checked the Colorado Avalanche Information Center, which is the website on the left. And you can see in that diagram in that left-hand corner, CAIC has uh, a map that shows the avalanche danger for a particular area in pretty much the whole state. You can click on that area and get a detailed forecast as well as the avalanche conditions. And if things are in the orange and red zone, uh, I'm definitely not going to go anywhere near steep slopes. And there are plenty of options in our books that do not have any avalanche danger at all or very minimal. So I think it's wise to pick your terrain according to who is along with you. And instead of having really arduous goals, make your primary goal safety and fun. And then, uh, you know, if everything is optimal and you have experienced super fit people and it's still early in the day, remember how short the days are right now. So if you're trying to summit something, you need to start at dawn and keep your eye on the clock because the days right now are really short. And I remember one time I was trying to summit Flattop Mountain and uh, before I knew it, I was walking back to the parking lot with my headlamp on in the dark uh, on, on snowshoes. Not a lot of fun picking my way through the trees in the dark. But anyway, there are a lot of great apps online that you can use. And I swear by the Colorado Avalanche Information Center. Great forecast, great videos and courses online. Um, and of course, CMC has avalanche safety courses, uh, as does the Colorado 
mountain school. So if you're going to be someone who wants to summit mountains in the winter and really get far into the backcountry, then you need to have an avalanche, a be avalanche beacon, and a shovel and probes and know how to use them. And don't go alone um, and take an avalanche course. If you're not that ambitious, you want to go out and have some fun and you're not going to go up on the high terrain, then you can uh, you don't necessarily have to do that. <clears throat> so I think the best part of owning a book is you can go through on a slow evening or a slow day and look at all of the options you have on any given day, check the weather forecast and pick something that's gonna be fun given what's going on. When I first wrote my snowshoeing book, I got a lot of grief from cross country skiers because snowshoers were trampling their ski tracks. And so I have since added this slide in. So if you're cross country skiing, take the left side, if you're on snowshoes, go on the right and try not to trample each other's uh, tracks. However, you know, some of our trails are much too narrow and having somebody on snowshoes compacting the snow for you so you don't have to break trail isn't all bad. <laughs> we do have good maps in our book, books as well. Um, Interesting thing about the snowpack, I think we've all noticed that climate change is real and the ski and snowshoeing season is becoming shorter. Uh, it's, you know, here it is after Thanksgiving and a lot of the trails up near where we live in Netherlands, like Brainerd Lake and uh, the Moffat Tunnel and places like that are still pretty rocky. So right now, uh, you're generally better off on snowshoes than you are on skis, although you can find some places like Brinder Lake Road where there are no rocks, you know, there's enough cover, you can ski it. But the snow lines are also climbing. So a lot of people say, well, where's a good place for me to go right now? Well, altitude is what it's all about. Birth had passed, 11,000 feet, good snow. Anything above 10,000 feet is going to have more snow generally. Um, but as I said, if you're going up on top of a uh, flat top mountain or beer stat, you may very well end up in some rocky sections where it's blown free, particularly early in the season. And avalanche danger is still an issue even early. All right, so I think we're ready to go yeah. into photos of trails. And as you saw that one photo of me, I was up on flat top, which is the mountain on the right. Uh, that you can get up on the trail from Bear Lake in Rocky Mountain National Park. Hallett's Peak is on the left, so it's a pretty long trek to get up on Hallett's in the winter, but it's not that difficult to the summit flat top, and you can go a lot shorter the summit <clears throat> and have a great time from the viewpoint there on the right, and it's good for skiing or snowshoeing. Trail Ridge Road. I was just up there a couple of weeks ago and it was skiable. So it's a road. So it's not super exciting, but on skinny skis, it can be a nice place to do some kicking and gliding early in the season. There are some places that get blown free of snow, but you get a beautiful view of the, uh, the mountains without the cars. And later in the season, you can get over from Trail Ridge Road to the old Hidden Valley ski area. And it's also a good place to snowshoe. Here again, though, because of the wind, you may have to take your snowshoes or skis off and carry them for a while. But if you want an early season spot that's 10,000 feet, this is the place you can go. And you have Estes Park right nearby for food and beverages. And this is a trail that's on the cover of the snowshoeing book. And it's a moderate outing up to Lake Helene. And that's not notched out mountain. You can also access some ski slopes on the northeast side of flat top from the Lake Helene Trail. Okay. 
nymph like, dream like, emerald like, also accessed from Bear Lake. Bear Lake has become popular year round, and it even, the parking lot even fills up in the winter. So if you want to go up there, you better get up there early. This trail, these trails, the first one up to Nymph Lake is quite easy for skis or snowshoes. Go up to Dream or Emerald Lake on skis, you need to be pretty experienced. It gets pretty narrow and get pretty icy. <clears throat> and this is where uh, if you're not there early, it gets pretty packed down by snowshoers and becomes much more challenging to get down. But it's no avalanche danger, beautiful winter wonderland. Sprague Lake, one of the easiest trails in Rocky Mountain National Park, summer or winter, about a mile around the, the lake. Great place to take kids and great views. Don't go on the lake, stay on the trail. Glacier Gorge Campground. The Sprague Lake Trail connects to Glacier Gorge. There's a big, a big parking lot right across this, the road from Glacier Gorge Campground, which is closed in the winter. So you can park there, put on your snowshoes or skis, and ski your snowshoe up to Sprague Lake and around if you want a longer trek than a mile and end up doing three, four, even five miles or taking some of the side trails from Glacier Gorge and Sprague Lake. This is also a trail you can access from Glacier Gorge. As you can see, this snowshoer didn't need to have her snowshoes on. She's carrying them, although there's plenty of snow. And the, the lock is Scottish for lake. Really spectacular view. And you can see one of the peaks in the background there. Moderate outing, no avalanche danger. Hollowell Park, great for beginners, very easy outing if you stay on the flats. You can go all the way to Cub Lake if you want to make it more of an adventure. It's off of the Bear Lake Road. Hidden Valley Ski Area. This is what I talked about. You can access from Trail Ridge Road and you can go to the bottom of Hidden Valley Ski Area. There's a warming hut, there's a nice big parking lot. There's a sliding tubing hill for little kids. And those trails are generally pretty safe from avalanches. Uh, so you can skin up uh, the trails on skis or snowshoe up. You can see the very top of Hidden Valley it does have a very steep slope below Tombstone Ridge. So you want to check avalanche conditions and not go up there if avalanche danger is high. But you can explore the lower parts of Hidden Valley and have a great outing. This is from the upper slope. I was up there with some friends in the spring. You can see it's really spectacular views of the Mummy Range. And this requires uh, advanced ski skills. And you know, you, from the road, um, Trailers Road, it's about a thousand foot skin up to the top of the ridge. So um, be prepared for a workout but it's really got some nice turns in when you get up there. And it's better to wait till spring when the, the snow's consolidated and there's no avalanche danger. This is a view at the beginning of the Beaver Reservoir Trail, the Continental Divide. <clears throat> and this is, you know, very uh, mellow trails. I would call it, you know, uh, easy for beginners on snowshoes and an intermediate uh, for people on skis. It's about uh, five miles north of Ward on the Peak to Peak Highway. And this is one of Kay's favorite spots. I'll let her tell you about it. Yeah. This is uh, Rock Creek, which is right out of Allen's Park. Um, it's the, you ski in on an old road, a nice gentle, uphill basically going in alongside a creek and um, you get to the base area of a defunct ski area that was running in the uh, in the 50s I believe and so there's some skiing in the trees off to the sides if you want to do some climbing and the thing I love about it is that the snow is always deep it seems like and always really great 
So if, if, you know, if you're gonna go in there on skis, you want some wider skis uh, if someone has a broken trail. Yeah. The Sourdough Trail goes north and south from Brainerd Lake all the way over to Beaver Reservoir. Um, it's a rolling roller coaster kind of trail, great for snowshoeing or skiing. I would say you need intermediate ski, ski skills and beginners can snowshoe. Although, you know, you can go out and back as far as you want because you can go up to 14 miles on the trail. From Brainerd Lake, you can go north or south. And Niwot Mountain is a great place for uh, skiing if it hasn't been too windy after a big storm. And uh, this is a view from Niwot, and it's really spectacular out there. But it's, it's advanced skiing because of the trees. You want to take a helmet, and uh, it can be real windy, so you want to pick up a day when it's not. Brainerd Lake has all kinds of trail options. And I've skied the Brainerd Lake Road uh, a couple of times this winter already. So there's enough coverage on the Brainerd Lake Road for kicking and gliding or snowshoeing. And some people uh, also like to hike it. Although at this point, it's probably getting a little deep for hiking. You don't want to go up there in running shoes, which I see a lot of people do that, unless you want to get some cold, wet feet. And it is, it starts at 10,000 feet at the parking area and climbs about 500 feet. So it's a lot of altitude, but it's a very mellow uh, rolling hills. Uh, if you get up to Brainerd Lake itself, which is about two miles one way, you might get blown off of your feet by the wind. If you don't, take advantage of that calm day, go around the lake, add another mile. And then when you go back, you'll have a, a total of about four miles, five miles total. And it is access to a lot of the trails from Bringer Lake Road. Long Lake is at the uh, end of the Brainerd Lake Road. You can access the trail up to Long Lake. So you've got about um, six miles round trip without going to the lake. You add in Long Lake and you know maybe six and a half round trip, but it's a gorgeous outing and you get to see some spectacular scenery when you get up there to Long Lake. And if you're really fit and ambitious, you can go all the way around Long Lake. No avalanche danger, great views, fun outing. You can also keep going up towards Isabel Lake. Left Hand Park Reservoir Road is right at the entrance of Brainerd Lake. Uh, it's a four wheel drive road in the summer and it's a great ski outing in the winter. Uh, it is uh, probably Good to have intermediate level ski skills, but you don't, you can be a beginner and head up there on snowshoes. It's about a 700 foot climb to get up to the reservoir. But when you get to the reservoir, this is the kind of view you'll get. It can also be really windy up at the reservoir. Um, yeah, so when you get up there, uh, you know, you, your, your stay at the reservoir might be brief. Yes. <laughs> But, you know, it's still a great outing. Totally this, worth this it. Is, yeah, and this is the way you get up on Niwot Mountain. So the trails at Brainerd are marked for snowers, snowshoers, excuse me, and skis, skiers, uh, and some that are for both. And there are also some that are, are uh, dog free by Brainerd Lake Road. You can go with dogs. And uh, there are also moose at Brainerd Lake. And it's that it has been the case that people have had their dogs off leash and gotten chased by moose. So this is a view from Brainerd Lake Road on a spring ski day. And that's Audubon Mountain in the background, which is actually one of the routes in the book.
The lower slopes are great for skiing or snowshoeing. Mitchell and Blue Lake, very long approach, but boy, is it worth it when you get up there. That's Piney Peak on the left. And it's, uh, you don't want to go up on the peaks generally because of avalanche danger, but just going up to Metro to Blue Lake is a great outing, but a long outing. So you want to have lots of food and, and drink. And it's uh, nice if you can stay in the Colorado Mountain Club cabin and then venture out from there. It cuts down on the, uh, the approach. So this is near the summit of Mount Audubon. And as you can see, once again, I had to take my snowshoes off and, and carry them uh, because of all the rocks. And it definitely was not skiable. The best skiing on a lot of the peaks like Bierstadt and Audubon that I have in the book are the lower slopes. The, because of the wind we have in Colorado, the upper slopes of a lot of our mountains get blown free of snow. So keep that in mind uh, and just be prepared to carry, but real spectacular and virtually no avalanche danger on Audubon. This is one of those grouchy guys I told you about. Um, as you've probably experienced, or maybe you haven't, uh, living up here, Kay and I noticed that the elk and the deer give way. They don't generally uh, want to hang out with people. And unless you really get nose to nose with a bull elk, they're not going to attack you. Moose are a different story. They're belligerent and they're grumpy and they don't back up. But generally, they're, they, they're not going to attack you if you maintain your distance. But my general rule of thumb, I'm sure case too, is you see a moose, turn around. Don't make eye contact and get out of out of the territory, change plans and take a different route. Because there have been cases, have had encounters with moose up here in the uh, Netherland, Roundsville, Greater Lake area, and they've gotten injured. You know, they if they do get grumpy, particularly with off-leash dogs, they can fracture your skull. So you don't want to take a chance. This is another sourdough trail access point, and this is off Rainbow Lakes Road. And the last time I was up there, it was still too rocky for skiing, but people were hiking it and snowshoeing it. After this storm, uh, it's probably still hikeable, but you might be able to have more fun on snowshoes. It's probably still a And that access point, you can go all the way up to Brainerd Lake. Rainbow Lake Road is a good place to, it closes in the winter and you can go up to eight miles round trip. I was up there the other day and I skied in spite of the fact that the gate was open and people were still driving on it. So I'm hoping that the uh, Boulder Watershed people in the park or the, uh, the National Forest Service closes the road so it's easier for us skiers and snowshoers to enjoy it. But it is a beautiful place to, for an easy outing in the winter. The Netherland area, you have to wait till you have a big upslope storm before you can ski and snowshoe. The West Magnolia trails are certainly hikeable in the winter uh, and very popular in the summer for biking and also fat tire biking in the winter. They're probably not quite enough snow right now for skiing, probably just about enough for, for snowshoeing. And probably most of them are still hikeable right now. They're best used after a spring snowstorm. Beautiful views of the uh, continental divide from these trails. Caribou Ranch open space, just a little north of Netherland, great place for snowshoeing or an easy ski outing.
I doubt there's enough snow right now for skiing, but it, and, and Mud Lake's probably similar. It's just about at the point where you can use snowshoes. And if you have some rock skis like I do, you don't okay. mind getting them beat up. You can probably use some, some skis. As I said, a good place for uh, learning how to ski is Nordic areas. We have Eldora, Snow Mountain Ranch, <clears throat> and Devil's Thumb in a book. But Eldora, Nordic area, is a good place to go snowshoeing as well. They're not open yet because we've had mediocre snow so far. But I heard they're grooming 17th Avenue and hope to be open after Christmas. But they have a good network of trails. And if you want a place where you can go on well-marked trails, a variety of different options in terms of challenge, uh, Eldora is a pretty good place to go. And also some excellent ski trails. It's a little more challenging to learn how to ski at Eldora because it is so hilly. But if you're an experienced skier, it's a great place to uh, ski and still possible to uh, learn how to ski here. I teach handicapped people at Eldora, so anything's possible. And it's a lot of, a lot of good fun options. Caribou Town Site is to be distinguished from Caribou Ranch. Caribou Road goes up about four miles to the old Caribou mining area, which is now reopened as a gold mine. And the downside is the road is pretty horrendous, not plowed. And <clears throat> so you really need a good high clearance four wheel drive with good snow tires to get up here. But if you can make it, there's some beautiful options for cross country skiing and snowshoeing. It's about 10,000 feet up there, <clears throat> as it is at the east portal of the uh, Amatsa Tunnel, where this photo was taken. So if, because it's 10,000 feet, you have better snow options earlier than some of the lower elevation places. So they're just getting good for snowshoeing. Probably need a little more time and another big snowstorm for skiing to avoid rocks and stumps. Um, there are several trail options at East Portal. This is an advanced ski or snowshoe options. It's about 10 miles round trip, but real spectacular when you get up there. You can see these side slopes could avalanche, so you want to be cautious on high avalanche days. But most of the trail, most of the trails you can navigate without avalanche danger if you stay below riders pass but it does require advanced ski skills. This is the Forest Lakes Trail, <clears throat> which is a great place to go. And if you're an advanced skier, you can get off trail and go through some powder without being likely to kill yourself. This is an early season photo. Arapaho Lakes is uh, in the same area requires advanced ski skills. It's steep enough for a potential avalanche, so don't go alone. And it, it, you know, it definitely can snowshoe it as well. Be prepared for about a thousand foot climb on a very steep tra uh, trail with um, thick trees. Golden Canyon State Park, very close to Golden, in between uh, Rollinsville and Central City. Lots of nice trail options for both snowshoeing, skiing, and in the winter, the road closes and you can hike on it. Great views of the Continental Divide from the raccoon trail that's in the boat. Intermediate ski skills, beginner snowshoeing. Okay, you want to talk about 
Table Mountain. Um, North Table Mountain um, in Golden. Uh, when there's a good storm down in the closer to the cities, great place to go for some uh, snowshoeing. Uh, probably not skiing, but lots of trails, easy access, um, and a, a fun day. And White Rock Ranch, um, same thing, just outside of Golden. Lots of trails, some good snowshoeing when it snows. So it's, it's a good option if uh, there's a snowstorm and you don't want to go too far. Um, You're better for snowshoeing than skiing. Absolutely, yeah. And Roxboro State Park, south of um, Denver. Again, um, good for snowshoeing. There's often more snow there than there is in the metro area. Um, so it's, it's a good option for snowshoeing that's close to the city and still a, a fun day out and about. They do, not, they do not allow dogs there. So that's just one thing I'd say. You, you have to leave your dog at home. Hey, James Peak, access from St. Mary's Glacier. Uh, not a great deal of avalanche danger, but this is, if you want to summit James Peak on snowshoes or skis, you definitely should have an avalanche awareness course and don't go up there on high avalanche danger days. St. Mary's Glacier, which is the first, was also an option in the book, much shorter and closer, can avalanche. This is Jones Pass. This is a avalanche class that I took venturing over to a spot where a lady was buried and killed, only 30 years old, got way off trail on snowshoes, so, uh, and didn't realize she was an avalanche terrain. Her, none of, she and her friends did not have avalanche beacons, shovels, or probes. So if you're going to go up to some of these more remote mountain areas, this is below Bertha Pass, make sure you're well prepared. And if you stay on the trail, which is a road, uh, the first mile or so is quite safe. Mount Ava, Evans Byway, fun place to go in the winter. There's a Colorado Mountain Club group that used to climb this every winter on January 1st. I don't know if they still do. There is one avalanche spot on the way up to the summit, Goliath Mountain. And so you don't want to go up there if there's high avalanche danger but you can do the first couple of miles of this road on skis or snowshoes or even hiking quite safely and it's just above Echo Lake. And because of its altitude, it can snow early. This is St. Mary's Glacier uh, near Idaho Springs. So you get in the ski traffic and you get off before it gets real bad. And there is a parking fee of $5, but the glacier is a lot of fun. Don't go on the steeper slopes because they can avalanche, but there are some very gentle slopes you can go on quite safely. And this is the access for uh, James Peak. Second Creek is off of uh, just below Bertha Pass. And it's, 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 there's a cabin up there. I believe it's 10th Mountain Division where you can stay. It's about a, it's a steep, almost 800 foot climb to get to the cabin. So it requires advanced ski skills, but uh, anybody can snowshoe it if you're in, in good physical condition. And uh, if you can't get a reservation, then you can, it's fun to just go up there and back in a day. You can go stay and, uh, Warner Park. First it Pass, I've heard people are already skiing up there because of its elevation, it's 11,000 feet. It gets snow early and then it stays. Used to be a ski area, so you can see the trails are wide and it's fairly safe. The steep slope on the right is avalanche terrain. If you go up the center of the trail and stay away from the, the steep trails, 
you can you can ski or snowshoe very safely on either the west side or the east side. But usually one person a year dies at birth and pass. Whoops. I just lost my picture. Hold on. Okay, well, uh, Devil's Thumb Ranch um, near Fraser, another great place to go to take a lesson or to um, ski or snowshoe. They have trails for both. Um, Alan, are you back with us? Uh, my picture has gone away. Okay. I can't tell you um, why. <laughs> can you go go with it okay yeah so um going back okay okay all right devil's thumb ranch the nice thing about devil's thumb for learning how to ski is there's a lot of flat terrain the uh ranch uh is near winter park the accommodations are quite pricey but the trail access is not and it's a beautiful backdrop for uh, being there's only really one snowshoe trail um, so it's better for skiing than session devil's thumb is one option snow mountain ranch has more trails and more and better snowshoe trails it's also known as the ymca of the rockies so they have accommodations that are a lot less expensive than Devil's Thumb. You can stay in the lodge, you can rent a cabin, and uh, it's a, a good buffet breakfast and dinner. And uh, the trees are growing back after the beetle kill. And uh, Todd Ludwig, former member of the U.S. ski team, now runs the place. So this is a summit of beer set. <clears throat> and, uh, you can have a lot of fun just going up to Guanella Pass. And there is another trail up there called Silver Dollar Nealer Lake. And you don't have to go to the summit to either ski or snowshoe on the lower slopes of Beerstadt safely. This is Nailer Lake, also up at Guanella Pass. Northern Colorado, up by Fort Collins, go west up to the Cameron Pass area, and then over to uh, the old the, the Colorado State University winter campus, mountain campus, and this Emmeline Lake, which is about 12 miles round trip, is a um, difficult outing, but you can go half that distance have a really wonderful time, uh, and it'll be just below Comanche Peak Wilderness. The areas around there did burn and one of the three massive forest fires, but I heard that this trail was still okay. Crown Point Road, part of it was burned, but it's now reopened because it's a road. Uh, it's not difficult to navigate. This is also up in the Cameron Pass area. Sawmill Creek, uh, spectacular place to go for uh, a, a ski or a snowshoe. And you can see Comanche Peak Wilderness in the background. This is also up at Cameron Pass. And you know, Fort Collins, from Fort Collins, you got to drive about an hour and a half <clears throat> to get up to uh, Cameron Pass. And none of these trails have any avalanche danger at all. Michigan Lakes Trail is on the west side of Cameron Pass. Montgomery Pass is a great place for uh, skiing. You can also snowshoe, but the slopes you're looking at are used by uh, backcountry skiers. And it would be a good idea to have either tele skis or AT skis. Every trail in our book, uh, in our ski, ski touring book, we say what kind of ski is optimal for that particular trail. Zimmerman Lake 
much easier outing than Montgomery Pass, right across the road. No avalanche danger at either place. Uh, I'd say call it a moderate five mile round trip. And they've been getting a lot more snow up in Cameron Pass and over to Steamboat than we have down here. So I think you'd find that it's much more skiable right now at Cameron than it is <clears throat> in the Indian Peaks. Rabbit Ears Pass, I just saw a report saying that Steamboat has gotten six feet of snow. So if you can find someone energetic to break trail for you, <laughs> you could have a really good time on Rabbit Ears Pass. Stay in Steamboat, a variety of trails in our ski touring book. But, you know, three hours one way to get to Steamboat. Kenosha Pass off of Highway 285 south of Denver. You can access the Colorado Trail and take a look at the Mosquito Range going west, but you can also go east on the Colorado Trail. No avalanche danger. Ski it or snowshoe it. And it's given us given the altitude, it's probably doable right about now. Mental Creek Loop is up on Tennessee Pass near one of my favorite vacation spots, Leadville. So go past Copper Mountain, head towards Leadville, and stop at the Mitchell Creek Loop, which is a real easy uh, outing on either skis or snowshoes. No avalanche danger at all. Spectacular views. Boreas Pass Road near Fair Play. You can also access this on the west side from Breckenridge, from the east side from Fair Play. Uh, you can safely ski or snowshoe a couple of miles on this road, which is close to cars in the winter, and have a beautiful time without seeing a lot of people. And uh, Fair Play has some great bed and breakfasts and a nice old hotel. The Gold Dust Trails are also in the area. Easy outing on skis or snowshoes. No avalanche danger. Mayflower Gulch is outside of Frisco, and it's a pretty steady climb up to this old mining camp with these spectacular views. And um, good for snowshoeing or skiing. Snow is usually really good. Colorado Springs, the Craigs area is on the west side of Pikes Peak. This is a Colorado Mountain Club outing, and it's a great place for snowshoeing or skiing. And uh, I think they've gotten pretty good snow cover at this point. And there's also a Mueller State Park that's also nearby on the west side of uh, Pikes Peak and outside of Colorado Springs. Independence Pass Road. This is a road that goes to Aspen in the summer and is closed in the winter. And you can access it from Leadville, south of Leadville. And it's a great place for skiing or snowshoeing. And there's some nice bed and breakfast over there. Or you can stay in Leadville. Twin Lakes is a great place for a family outing. Spectacular mountains, 14 years to look at on a very mellow rolling trail with no avalanche danger, good for skiing or snowshoeing. And its elevation is pretty high, so I wouldn't be surprised if they don't have good snow coverage at this point for either activity. And that's it. That's it for our tour. Yeah, so thanks for listening. And this is only a fraction of the trails in our books. Our books have close to 100 trails each. And we can keep you busy for a very long time if you get one of them. I don't know if we have any questions. Excellent. Thank you, Alan and Kay. I know I have a lot more places on my list now that I want to go ski touring. Um, we do have one question about 
some terminology. Um, could you kind of talk a little bit about the difference between Nordic skiing and what does that mean, especially with um, backcountry skiing versus cross-country skiing? Well, Nordic skiing is, is pretty much uh, the same as cross-country skiing. They were, you know, it's cross-country skiing, although it was invented, you know, there's some debate as to where it was invented, Norway, Sweden, uh, or Tibet. So, but in any case, I think people, it's kind of commonly become, become the case that people talk about Nordic skiing, they mean a developed groomed ski area versus backcountry. <clears throat> so the, the skills are very similar except when you're going into the backcountry, you're generally, or I should say, generally you can go up uh, and steeper slopes off trail uh, in the trees and you need skins and either uh, telemark skis or alpine tourist skis because they're wider and you can handle steeper trails with deeper snow. So Nordic skiing has come generally to be known as the type of skiing that's done in a Nordic ski area, like Eldora or Devil's Thumb. There are a lot of others too. There's one in Breckenridge Ridge and Skiing Boat. And uh, so that's the general nomenclature. This, the Nordic skiing tends to be on much skinnier skis now, if someone from Scandinavia was listening to me, they'd say, you're, you're wrong, Mr. App, because us Nordic skiers in Scandinavia take our skinny skis and go anywhere we want to. And when I first moved to Colorado and started backcountry, cross-country skiing, all I had was skinny skis, and I was on the Sourdough Trail and other places and trying to kill myself. So it's uh, now you can go on those trails with Nordic or cross country skis that are wider and they're much easier to ski downhill if the ski is wider and has some metal edges. I hope that explains it. Does anyone else have any other questions um, for our speakers tonight? If so, please put them in the chat. Um, and Andrea Larson is the winner of the CMC buff tonight. Thank you, Thank you, everyone, for attending. And thanks, everybody, yes, thank and you. happy holidays, and have, have fun out there. Yes. Have fun, be safe, and happy holidays. Thanks, Alan and Kay, and everyone, thanks for attending tonight, and we'll see you on the trails. Thank you. Take care. Thanks.